Indochina relations, post the PLA misadventures in Dokalam, Ladakh, Sikkim, etc. Also, anti Indian activities by China in Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Maldives, etc. Under COVID 19 pandemic overhang and the way forward for India. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without wasting any further time, let me briefly introduce our first speaker, Jan Shankar Roy Chaudhary. He was chief of the army staff during the mid 90s and has, done, and has been a Rajya Sabha member from 1999 to 2005. General Shankar Roy Chaudhary has been our organization's founding member, president, and is now our mentor. He is known for speaking his mind, a keen follower of domestic and international events. I will request him to set the stage, so to say, of our deliberations today. Uh, General Shankar Roy Chaudhary, it was during your time at the helm as an army commander and then later on as chief that the peace and tranquility agreements of 1993 and 96 were negotiated and signed. Did we become complacent after this, like we did after the Punch Shield agreements? For two and a half decades thereafter, there was no visible development in infrastructure on the border areas, as also no upgrades in the armed forces. And our foreign policy also, including the military leadership, lacked a sense of direction. Did we not read the Chinese inter intentions correctly? Or were we so naive? Your opening comments, please. General Shankar Roy Chaudhary. Sir, you have to unmute your mic, Shankar Roy Chaudhary, sir. Unmute your mic. Unmute your mic, sir. Please click. Yes, sir. That's right. Okay. Okay. Now it is a. I suppose when you talk of this context in the year 2020, it seems strange that back in 1941, I think, or 42, those of us who have seen a Hindi movie, Doctor Kotniski Amar Kahani. The immortal story of Dr. Kotnes. Dr. Kotnes took a medical mission to Kuomintang, China in those days when the Japanese had invaded China in the Second World War. And he took an unofficial mission, volunteered, and he went to China to minister to the sufferings of the Chinese at that time. This was back in 1941, I think, or 42 which people have totally forgotten, except uh, though I must tell you, the Chinese do remember. The Chinese do remember because when a Chinese delegation visits India, I have found on more than one occasion, they take the, they make the effort, they take the trouble to search out, they came, the widow of Dr. Kurt Kotnis, he has passed away, she has passed away long time ago, but they make it a point to visit his, uh, his his relatives who are still surviving. I think that's a gesture which very few people will do. And that certainly uh, uh, is something that the Chinese have come and always, if I remember, they do that here when they come to India. So as I said, uh, that is something that we have taken note of. But subsequent events, Subsequent events have not been so bright. Uh, we, of course, started off in uh, we, when we got our independence in 1947. The then People's Republic of the sorry, the People's Republic of China got their independence in 1948. Am I right? Yes. So we are more or less the same age. We've grown together. And that was the time of Panchil when we had our uh, leaders, Jawaharlal Nehru, Chauvin Lai, uh, to, who had a personal relationship. And uh, the Panchil, the five, the principles of non interference in each other's activities, support of the United Nations, we developed on that uh, basis. But then 
1962 brought about a sea change in the whole affairs the events leading up to 1962 when uh, chawan lai said that we do not recognize the mcmahon line we do not recognize the mcmahon line and we should renegotiate the border to which our political leaders at that time jawahar lal nehru did not agree and that has set the stage for uh, sino indian relations or yeah. india china relations thereafter and we have had uh, the 1962 war the 1962 border war in which india did not fare well has set the stage for uh, relations between india and china this has fluctuated but mostly negatively in the meanwhile china has gone from economic strength to economic strength and now uh, the nations of south asia surrounding india they tend to support china in most matters china also has helped them a lot uh, which naturally we are trying to compete with so now there is a stage of competition between india and china to win hearts and minds in south asia uh, there have been uh, as i said 1962 then we had doklam or as we call it in india dokala dokala is a pass in the eastern himalayas from which uh, land communication by road by track rather comes all the way down to north bengal in the uh, uh, siliguri area provides a direct line of communication to ind- to interdict if people so desire what we call the chicken's neck or the constriction of uh, indian territory between bangladesh and uh, bhutan sikkim so this is a point of in- interdiction which we are we in india are very sensitive about uh, and with india china relationships not being uh, not being very uh, happy or not being positive towards each other this is a weakness which india has always kept a wary eye upon uh this has been followed up in sikkim there has been there are territorial this uh, territorial disagreements between india and china in northern sikkim the northern fringes of sikkim and latest is ladakh ladakh of course was a theater of war in the 1962 operation but of late during the galwan crisis it has flared up again in a major way and uh, india has reinforced its forces in ladakh which has become a frontline state some say more or less like jammu and kashmir is pakistan so this is an aspect which india indian uh, establishment and the indian public is watching keenly how india will react as far as india is concerned uh, the change of government uh, under the present dispensation that is uh, uh, prime minister modi started off on what seemed to be a warm warm footing when he reached out they had interaction with uh, president xi jinping went off very well again but now again the whole thing has come the whole thing has come and now we are on stand two more or less against china so india china relations which is the theme of this uh, this portion of the discussion is the relations are not good 
Now, that is in the strategic sense. It is in the economic sense that China has far outstripped India, far outstripped India. And that for that, India is directly to blame. China has flood has economically poured in economic assistance to all South Asian nations uh, and now is pouring in economic assistance to the African nations. And nobody can really object to that, least of all the nations who are recipients of the aid from China. And if we wish, if we wish to compete with China, the policy is compete, contain, confront. Compete, contain, confront. So we have to compete with China. Where possible, we have to contain China, particularly in the uh, strategic sense in areas where we are in opposition to each other, like in Ladakh. But unless we economically match them, I'm afraid our relations will remain one of envy, I would like to call it, on the part of India, and a sense of superiority on the part of China. Now the Answer to that is India has to build up its own superiority in the eyes of its own people and in the eyes of the world. Chinese goods have a huge market in India for good reason, because they are much cheaper and of good quality than the goods we produce ourselves. And unless we can develop our own goods and commercial output, low cost, high standards. It's a, it is uh, uh, an issue which is very difficult to meet. But if China can do it, we have to do it. Now, our corporate sector, our economic sector, is this is due to so-called um, a, a huge support from the government of China, which subsidizes its products. Well, I'd like the Indian government to subsidize Indian products rather than, you know, uh, be jealous of China. We want our government to subsidize our own products so that they can compete with Chinese goods in price and above all in quality. That magic has got to be achieved. Uh, the other thing that we have to live down is 1962 seems to be have cast a permanent shadow on our strategic sense. We've got to live that down in the eyes of the people. And I think the recent uh, functioning in Galwan Valley has brought a lot of, um, I will say euphoria, but a sense of pride back to India. That's good. That's good. And I'm glad that has come. But again, I come back to the crux of the issue, economics. Can India compete with China economic, economically? Unless that comes about, I am afraid Indo-China relationship will not have a, a environment of mutual comfort. Because there is comfort when we feel that we have nothing to fear from China. But now, not fear, I mean to say compete or a threat from China. As of now, India perceives distinct threats from China on the land communications between India via Tibet into the Tibet Chinese mainland and also by the South China Sea where there is an intense competition between the freedom of the seas in South China Sea, East China Sea, 
where we are trying to, and has come a long way, to develop the quad, quad agreement between Australia, China, India, so that we can compete with China by sea as well. That in, in the process, China has built up a large navy. Economics must always be backed up. Good economics, lasting economics, lasting prosperity has got to be backed up by a strategic strength, which we have lost from time to time. We've got to build that up along with our economy. Unless we can do that, we will find that these so-called misadventures, which we tend to... Misadventures is actually not a correct uh, term. I would not like to use it because misadventure conveys a sense of envy, of, 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 of trying to, you know, uh, pull down our or hide our own lack of success in Doklam, East Ladakh, and Sikkim. Sir, may I request you to wind up, sir? Okay, I have been asked to wind up. So I think I will come to a... I'll finish my talk. And now what is the uh, what is the issue? I have to ask them for questions. Questions are... Uh, we, will have, we will have time allocated, sir, later after the entire uh, panelists have spoken for a question and answer session. All right. Minutes. That will okay, be the I'm time finished. I will I'm interact finished. with the panelists once again, sir. I've finished. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And there could not have been a better start to our deliberations today. I distinctly remember General Shankar Roy Chaudhary stating in earlier forums that we, with China, must follow a policy of compete, cooperate, and confront. I think that the powers that be understand this in its full context and take this as a mantra. You couldn't have taken a more succinct view of enunciating our policy towards China. Compete, cooperate, and confront. Thank you, General Shankar Rai Chaudhary. I will now call upon our next speaker, Lieutenant General John Ranjit Mukherjee. General Mukherjee is presently president of our organization, a soldier and an academic. He has commanded the Indian Army's 15 Corps and was also the Chief of Staff of Eastern Command. In both these appointments, he dealt with military issues with China at the highest level. He is an authoritative voice on our Northeastern region and has many articles and books to his credit. Very few know the LSE with China like he does. In fact, he spent more time out of office carrying out reconnaissance of the entire area of Ladakh when he was there as GOC 15 Corps, then in office himself. Uh, General Mukherjee, we all would like to understand what exactly is the dispute with China as related to the LSE, and why is it that the citizens of this country do not quite comprehend this perception of LSE as viewed by both us and China? General Mukherjee, please state your case. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A pleasure to be amongst you and to be able to speak to you. I'll get straight to the point because there's very little time. I'll come straight on to the issue. Our size length of the border is about 4,000 kilometers, of which China has claimed roughly about 140,000 square kilometers. Pakistan out of this has already illegally ceded 6,500 kilometers to China in the Gilgit-Baltistan uh, region. And China has seized 38,000 kilometers in Aksai Chin. Besides the areas they have just occupied this year after April. The other claimed areas are in other parts of Ladakh, Himachal Pradesh, uh, Tibet border sector, UP Tibet border sector, the Nepal junction, part of Sikkim, 
parts of Bhutan which, with whom we have a treaty for their defense, and almost the whole of Arunachal, north of the Lohit River. Now, coming on to the terms, the McMahon line applies to the east. Came, up, came about as a result of an agreement between the Tibetans, the British, with the Chinese representative present in 1911, 1912, and finally agreement signed in, in 1914 at Simla. That runs along the watershed in the eastern sector. The LSC, when we talk about it, pertains to the Ladakh sector. Now, when you come on to the Ladakh sector, you have the Johnson Line, which was framed by a British surveyor, which is what India claims, which is much to the east of where the Chinese are currently located and includes the areas illegally seized by them. The Chinese claim, generally speaking, a little beyond the McDonald McCartney line, which was drawn up by a British officer and suggested as being more defensible against the Russians because that was the fear in those days. Now the Chinese have gone even beyond the McDonald McCarthy line. Other than that, the other two lines which people often talk about are the Johnson Hardag line and the Foreign Office line, both of which were coined in the early, early, early 20th century. But we'll not bother about that because we don't have the time. Question answer period, if any questions, I'll answer. The Chinese have come well beyond the Johnson line and are almost up to the McCartney line. In the Jepsan Plains in Ladakh, they have come well beyond it. In fact, they went a good 18 kilometers beyond the Johnson line. In Pangangso, it's been on the news. I'm not going to delve into details regarding that. As far as the eastern sector is concerned, they have occupied illegally Longju way back in the 80s, as also occupied uh, an area up to Bisakane Bridge. Now, coming on to the other claimed areas, in the Himachal Pradesh sector, they claim a small area. The watershed is very broad. It's astride the Shipkila Pass. It's a broad path. So they have claimed an area extending about 500 meters inside that. So not a very large claim, but they have claimed Indian territory also. You come on to the Uttarakhand uh, Tibet border sector, the number of areas that they have claimed. But the particularly important area is uh, the Barahoti Plain across the, the crest line, where they claim that due to uh, the uh, nomads having brought across with their come across with their goats and their animals, that entire entire area belongs to Tibet and hence to China. But in addition to that. They have talked about Badrinath, they have talked about Harsil, and they have talked about Lipu Lake. Lipu Lake is on the uh, Nepal border, and the quarrel there is with the Tri-Junction. The Chinese, in fact, have claimed well south of all Tri-Junctions that are, have been officially approved. For the simple reason that they bypass Indian defenses. Then you come on to 
Nepal, as far as Nepal is concerned, though we don't have uh, a defense treaty with them anymore, but they have claimed various areas of theirs and illegally occupied no less than seven villages. Coming on a step further, and then also very recently, coming on a step further, you go straight on to Bhutan, uh, rather uh, Sikkim first. In Sikkim, they have claimed the Fingers area in North Sikkim, which is a small patch, which has religious significance for Tibet. And they have claimed three kilometers south of the tri-junction on the Dolam Plateau. Everybody calls it Doklam, but the correct pronunciation is the Dolam Plateau. Uh, we blocked them and at Dolam two years ago, three years ago, but they bypassed it and they forced their way through Bhutan. So now they hold most of Dolam and therefore sit on our flanks and rear. They have also occupied most of Western Bhutan up to the Halakula Ridge Line, including a place called Saritha. Then you come on to Central Bhutan, a small area on the Central Bhutan border, using it as a blackmailing point for the Bhutanese for negotiations. And in Eastern Bhutan, they have just reactivated their original claim to Sakteng. Sakteng bypasses complete Tawang defenses. In Arunachal Pradesh, Tawang area, the whole of the Tawang belt extending almost up to Rupa. Uh, many of you may not know where Rupa is, but let me say well south of Bomdela and Sela Pass, almost uh, three quarters of the hill area, the area that was under the, at one stage, under the Zong, uh, the Zongpa of Tawang. And uh, for a very short period under the Zongpa of Sonazong in Tibet. So it's a huge area that they're looking for there, which points like a dagger but down into the plains and threatens the Siliguri Corridor. Then in the other areas, uh, what we call the rest of Arunachal Pradesh, they have not voiced their claims openly, but in 1962, they came in along the Siong, Siong Valley, right up to where we are deployed now, as also along the Manigang Valley. So obviously, that is part of their claims, which they will voice later on. They have not voiced it so far. Thereafter, you come on to the Siang Valley, it is now that they have started building a road into Siam, coming right up to Pisik, which is a little south of the border. They tried to do it and they've been blocked. Then you come on to Dembu and Anini area, a uh, very difficult area even for them. Hence, they have not claimed anything yet, but I'm sure they will claim something there later on. Then the last area is one of our bureaucrats left a marked map, a wrongly printed map of the Survey of India way back in 1960 at Singapore during negotiations after the Colombo proposals, in which there was a big fish tail marked on the map wrongly inside Indian territory being shown as China. So that entire area, which we still call fishtails, is what they claim. And the last area to the south is the Burma, India, Tibetan Tri-Junction. They claim a good 10 kilometers to the south, which means they claim the entire area down the Lloyd Valley, extending up to Walong, up to and inclusive of Walong. Those are what they claim. Now, I'll rush through very quickly. Uh, so you have a minute or two just left. Okay. 1962 was not a border dispute. It was to teach India a lesson. 
1959 onwards, 1962, first set of uh, disagreements, then 1967, in uh, again, then again 86, 87, incursions. Then the entire period of the last 10 years, repeated incursions. Then recently, Tooting and Siang also. War hysteria, modernization of the PLA. Middle Kingdom attitude, economic rise, started looking down on India. Built up offensive infrastructure in Tibet. Total support to Pakistan. Blocked India's entry into the Security Council and the Nuclear Suppliers, suppliers Group. Colluding with Pakistan on JNK nuclear pro uh, proliferation and supplying them weapons. Then the China Pakistan economic corridor, which India objects to, instigating our smaller neighbors against us. String of pearls at Chokpu, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Sudan, Gwada, alienating Sri Lanka, Nepal. Now trying to alienate Bhutan and Myanmar. Mazudasa, Brahmaputra, trying to damn it. Trade balance deficit, flooding the northeast with the Chinese goods. Present troop built up and a breach of breach of agreement in Ladakh and Sikkim. The quarrel is Indian sanctuary to Dalai Lama, interference in Tibetan affairs. The border dispute, India closing up to USA, Japan, Australia, and Vietnam. The South China Sea. India entering that area, not bowing down to China. CPEC, of course, Dolam blocking China, the Siang sector. Your poor opinion of Indian democracy. India blaming China for the COVID-19 fiasco. Trying to take away industry from China. Article 370 and 35A and proclamation that we will take back Aksai Chin and we will take back POK, threatening China. Collusion with Pakistan to uh, of the link up with Gilgit. Indian infrastructure threatens Chinese the CPEC. The threat to POK in northern areas and Aksai Chin. India blocking India, Indian Ocean routes. The way forward, whether we like it or not, we can't choose our neighbors. We have to resolve this problem, and sometime or the other, we have to befriend China. We have to come about with a more rational foreign policy and economic partnership at some stage, but from a position of military force. Uh, that's all I've got for the moment. If there are any questions later on, I'll bring it up. Thank, Thank you. you so much, sir. Thank you, General Mukherjee, for not only explaining the entire gamut of the claims across the border with China, but also many of the disputes that have arisen since then. I take this opportunity to also welcome Professor Kondapale and Dr. Lalwani. We have noted that both of you have joined. Our next speaker on the panel is Dr. Mohan Guruswami, widely traveled academic, economist, columnist and a highly respected voice in policy making circles is also the chairman and founder of the center for policy alternatives and a former advisor to the finance minister in the upa regime mr guru Swami, you have stated and i quote that the joint announcement of indian foreign minister s jay shankar and his chinese counterpart wang yi in moscow is like straws for drawing men to clutch. You also point out with telling statistics the reality of weaknesses that we as a nation are saddled with and the need to resolve these before we venture to address our relations with China from a position of equal stature. It will be interesting to hear your articulation. Your floor, Mr. Thank you very much, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for inviting me today. Uh, it's nice to be back uh, with channels, though I would prefer to be in Calcutta with you than in sitting in my room in Hyderabad. But I'll start off where General Shankar Roy Chaudhary began, 
by, on Dr. Cortes. Dr. Cortes was actually invited to, to China by General Chude, who was the Communist Party leader. And and Kubas Nagos was the president of the Communist Party at that time. Uh, and uh, he uh, went to China in 1938, and he was there in 42 where he died. He had married a, a Chinese lady called uh, Li Quing, Quing Lan, Quing Lan. And they had a, a son called Yin Hua. Yin for India and Hua for China. And when I went to Beijing, uh, my second or third visit, I went to the International Book House. And uh, there, the the, uh, the shop manager very kindly showed me a copy of Dr. Cortez's Amal Kahani, translated in, into, into Chinese. But having said that, uh, nationalism came to India and China about the same time, in the early 1900s. Sun Yat-sen launched the revolution in China in 1911, and uh, Mahatma Gandhi came back, Mohandas Gandhi came back in 1915. And we struggled in different ways to establish our national identity, China through a series of civil wars that culminated in the prominent triumph. Sir, so a small intervention. Could you just lean into your mic a little bit, sir? Yeah, okay. Uh, which uh, eliminated in the communist triumph in 1947. India, as you know, got its independence in 47. And together, we, for the first time in their long history, the people of the two, the majority of people of the two countries, got a chance to voice their aspirations. 95% of China, as you know, is Han, and the Han people actually came to power for the first time in China's long history through the Communist Party. The Hindus, who were out of power for, for, uh, for almost a millennium, also found expression. And you know, we chose two different paths after that. And the rest is more recent history. But in 1620, that is when the British first came to India, and Amazon arrived in India, Indian and Chinese GDPs together accounted for 55% of the world. And in 19, 1950, when both of us began to rise together, our combined GDP was 5.5% of the world. So that's where the world left us in those 300 years, the period of darkness. And in, in, in 2020, China and India together account for about 28% of the world. With, uh, China being a much larger partner in India, so three times India's, three and a half times India's size right now. Now, there is an asymmetry between these two countries. The asymmetry has become more pronounced since the year 2000 when the Chinese economy accelerated at a pace we have never seen in history before. And India also began to accelerate in 2000, but around 2010 or 11, it began faltering because we missed out on making capital expenditure. We were spending most of our money on consumption. The government became a big consumer of government funds. Then we started giving a lot of money away on companies. As well, capital expenditure was dropping off and has been continuously dropping from 2011 to 2020. So, Unless you pick up capital expenditure, you're not going to go. That's one point when I'm trying to make, when you have to come back into, into reckoning with China, that you have to spend more money on investment in the country, on infrastructure, on in, in production, and creating jobs for people. Unless you do that, you're not going to grow and to able to match China. Second point I'd like to make is that in 1962, when India and China last fought, it is a major country. The Chinese GDP was little, per capita GDP, was little less than India. In 1976, we were about the same. And then from 1976, they have accelerated. And now today, the Chinese per capita GDP is about four times Indian per capita GDP. 
That is the size of your territory. <laughs> both countries spend the same amount of money on defense. Their military will always be bigger and better provisioned and better armed. Now that is a given. We cannot afford in India at this stage to put more money on defense. And though for some reason, if we had made investment in defense production, then it would have also expanded our GDP. But we prefer to spend money on imports. Even today, 60-65% of our capital expenditures are on imported equipment. Uh, as long as you are importing that, you can never really become strong and powerful. And that is a given. Now, there is much talk about, you know, whatever happened in, in, in Ladakh, the Chinese are clearly aiming to go back to the claim line of 1962. That's the line they, they claimed when the, when the conflict began. And they're moving towards that line. And <clears throat> we have been having blocking formations at different places. And every time we sleep a little, we ingress a bit. So since 62, they've ingressed further and further and come down in, in for instance, in, in, in the Galwan Valley, they were about 40 kilometers upstream from the, from the junction of the uh, Galwan and Shok River. Now they're only two kilometers. In. Similarly, in that time, they were, they were advanced. And so they've been doing it. At some stage, India has, to, has had to take a call. And we took a call this, this summer in Ladakh. And we moved in troops there. And we're holding a, a, a line there, which seems to be fairly secure and solid. But if the conflict breaks, then you know, some of our positions in DBO and other places become very untenable. Because you know you've got to be uh, the supply lines are long, and that corridor from Darbuk to Dibio is 230 kilometers and about 5 to 10 kilometers wide. So holding that line might be difficult, so we might have to escalate to air. We get to air again. We see the Chinese have several advantages. They have 18 forward airfields between Xinjiang. Tibet and Yunnan, which are within easy flying reach of India. For instance, the, uh, they have airfields at Hotan, the complexes, Gargunsa, Gonkar, Naku, Donshu, Hopping, Gonka, Anka, Lingui, all these airfields are very close to, to, uh, to, to India. And from these airfields, Indian airfields, like Tesco, is 325 kilometers, Gawati is 355 kilometers, Bandogra is 381 kilometers, Dora is 430, Chabua is 455. Similarly, in the northern side, Ambala, uh, Kandigar, Bareli, Saranpur, and all these airfields are close to Chinese forward airfields. Now, there's a difference. You know, we can always go back to counter strikes. Uh, on their, their airfield, but their airfields are in the middle of a desert. For instance, Gonkar, which is Lhasa's airport, is 60 kilometers from Lhasa. You have to go through a tunnel to go to Gonkar. And Gonkar is in the middle of a desert. Similarly, Hotan is in the middle of a desert. So, when a Chinese attack comes on Tezpur, and you know they all come to highly populated areas. So are we, do we have the civil defense to keep our population in check, to prevent panic? Remember 1962, one of the reasons why we didn't use there was that Jawaharlal Nehru and others were morbidly afraid of panic setting in in Calcutta. They saw what happened in, in, in 1942 when there was a threat of um, a rare attack on, or Japanese attack on Calcutta. People had to leave in Calcutta. And so, you know, we are not prepared for any kind of escalated conflict uh, if it might take to the air. Now, what, and even this war, if it takes, the world will not let two countries, which are so important to world economic growth, and two countries which have also nuclear arms, to fight for very long. You might have a war for 10 days, 15 days, but our challenge is can, can this war be contained only to the ground? In 60, like like in 62, without use of air power and in a limited sector, a small number of troops relative to our forces engaged. 
it might be difficult. It's still, still out of hand. So, you know, Indian candidates keep talking about, constantly talk about air, but I have to caution them that air also has short with consequences. The Indian Air Force has just about now got a, a cross border capability, but China has got a huge buffer in the shape of Tibet between the Indian mainland and the Chinese mainland. So you've got a long range to travel. There's no point going and drop, dropping something in the middle of a desert. The world will not notice it. But if the, if the Chinese drop a, uh, and launch an attack, say, on, on, on Tezpur, Tezpur will be seen as an Indian town attack. India will be seen as Delhi attack. So these are all, you know, in terms of media terms, this becomes big news in the world. So the objective of this next conflict at all is to see that give a perception of having come out well. Now that might be a tall order at this moment. Then we keep talking about the Indian Ocean as the place of sin. Now the Chinese do import a lot of oil. They import almost 60%, 40%, 60% of their oil. And most of this oil comes, 70% of that import oil comes from the Middle East. And the sea lane is run within 300 kilometers of the Indian coastline. But the Chinese have been clever. They have built up strategic reserves of 506 million barrels. At the same time, India has strategic reserves of only 38 million barrels. So if there's an ocean side conflict and the tankers stop moving around, most of the tankers which carry oil are, are global tankers carrying third country flags. They come to India, they go to China, they go to Japan. So if you block them, we might also get affected. We have to think these issues through. War is not going to be easy. And war is going to set India, which is on the, on the verge of a, a, a breakthrough, an economic breakthrough, because our demographic cusp is just right. We have a largely youthful population. And if we don't use this opportunity for the next 30 years, which we have, we will never get it again for another 200 years. Because so we have a minute or two more for you, sir. Yeah. By 2060, we'll be an aging country. So our strategy would be like Deng told China in 1980 that, you know, lie low, focus on growth. Our strategy should be also to lie low and focus on growth. Every now and then we get very excited, you know, we're talking out of turn. And I think we've got to eschew that a bit and, you know, hold our horses. Our time will come and we have to prepare for that time. Thank you. Have you finished, sir? Yeah, I have finished. Thank you so much, Mr. Puruswami. As usual, yours is a very sane voice among all the belligerents and test thumping that is being done across television channels at the moment. I hope people are listening in and have an apprehension of what we are into at the moment. Our next speaker is Hello. Professor Sankrant Kondapalli. Uh, Professor Kondapalli, Okay. Have you been able to connect? Mute your mic. I've already done it. Professor Kondapalli, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can. Uh, we have. Yes, now it's clear. You can hear you properly. And a warm welcome to you, sir. Uh, viewers, and our dear panelists, you all know Professor Kondapalli. He is presently with the Department of Chinese Studies at JNU, widely quoted by both the domestic and international print and audiovisual media. He is an authoritative voice on India China relations. Having not only learned the Chinese language at Beijing Language and Culture University, he is also a postdoctoral researcher and a visiting fellow at People's Repub University in Beijing. His voice is heard with considerable respect by policymakers and forums in both India and China. Uh, Professor Kondapalli, over time, you have been one of the strong voices who have stated that relationship between the two Asian powers could be mutually beneficial. But you have also been highly critical of China's attitude. India is also the Chinese 
shock at India's revisiting to its, uh, should I say, resistance to the expansion, expansionist designs at the moment. How do you see the present standoff between India and China? And what could be the way forward in this cloud of nationalism, mistrust, and deep animosity that presently exists between both nations? Uh, Professor Kondapalli, please state your case. Uh, thank you very much, General Mukherjee, uh, and a very good evening to all the participants. Let me thank the Senate's K for once again inviting me. Um, I think the uh, the Chinese perceptions uh, in the current uh, situation on uh, Aksai Chin Ladakh borders uh, this has become very um, diversionary in nature. Uh, China has been changing the goalposts um, frequently. Uh, thirdly, today's comments by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in Beijing, Mr. Wang, about the Ladakh Union Territory, uh, as well as the 1959 line, November 7, 1959 line that Chowan Lai suggested to Nehru. Uh, this suggests that China is looking for a desperate solution for the kind of armed stalemate that we have gone through for the past five months. Uh, China doesn't see much of a scope in this uh, conflict. Uh, and if the conflict escalates, China has uh, a lot to lose, uh, including possibly its rise. Uh, which has been assiduously built up uh, with the American assistance since the Tang Xiaoping's visit to the White House in 1979. Uh, so that is one aspect that I would like to highlight. China is today desperate for a solution. And so it is shifting the goalposts, both at Moscow Five Point Agreement as well as at the military commanders meeting recently. Uh, so raising of this issue of 1959 line is a symptom of that uh, diversionary tactic and desperation, uh, number one. Number two, if you look at the Chinese constituents, uh, the topmost decision maker in China is the small leading group of the Communist Party's Politburo Standing Committee. Uh, related to foreign affairs, related to the security, related to uh, a number of issues. Small leading group in public domain, we do not know whether they have met or not. However, the China study group has met at least twice so far uh, to take stock of the situation, both on June 15th night when 20 Indian soldiers were killed, as well as recently, there was the meeting. So when you compare China and India, it appears the topmost decision making is absent in the case of China. Of course, it doesn't mean President Xi Jinping or other Politburo members are not aware of this. Uh, even though Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited Ladakh, Raksha Mantri Rajnath Singh, the CDS, the Army Chief, the Indian Air Force Chief have visited Ladakh frequently. Uh, we have only one, that is Foreign Minister Wang Yi visiting Tibet. We do not know whether any other officials have visited. Of course, Pancham Lama, China's appointed Pancham Lama visited recently in order to pep up the Tibetan side. Uh, he is seen behind the curtains, not interacting with the people in the photographs, uh, which also suggests that he was also not able to circulate among the people. Uh, the next level of uh, the decision making is in the foreign ministry, which has made some substantial comments in the recent times. Uh, for example, uh, on Galwan, on Pankungso Lake, on uh, the Spangur Gap and other um, areas. Uh, the foreign ministry said that they have always 
belong to that of China. Uh, of course, the Chinese never gave India its maps, nor has given any evidence regarding why or how these lands belong to that of China. Chowan Lai's statement was a unilateral statement saying that this line should be accepted. India has, as, uh, as John, uh, General Johnny Mukherjee mentioned, there is the McCartney uh, McDonald line, Ardak Johnson line, there is the September 8th, 1962 line, or the ceasefire line, or a number of other uh, um, scenarios. But the Chinese have suggested this should be the line, forgetting for the moment that the joint statements between India and China say that any resolution of the territorial dispute has to be fair, uh, reasonable, and mutually acceptable. It cannot be unilateral from one or the other. So to that extent, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs statement that all these lands always belong to China um, brings us all the notions of South China Sea when China walks away from the permanent code of arbitration and other international rules and regulations uh, and asserts its ownership over these. Ministry of External Affairs reminded the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that this is an exaggerated claim and this is untenable. Uh, and it also reminded that China's position in discussions since 1960 and 1981 have been different from what it had stated now. So this is one which we can say the changing of the goalposts uh, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing. Um, the second, uh, the third main uh, actor in the Chinese perceptions, we can say the media, uh, especially China's Global Times, which come to, comes under the Central Committee Propaganda Department, uh, has been very active. Uh, in fact, on August 29th night, when the Special Frontier Force regained control over the five mountain tops, Global Times published nearly six articles and others published uh, more articles as well in China, uh, which suggests they have actually shaken up, uh, become very paranoid about what the SS SFF can do in terms of the military operations in Ladakh. Uh, so Global Times articles have been um, an expression of that uh, militarism, nationalism, as General Mukherjee has mentioned. Uh, when you look at, they also suggest that uh, India has no money to defend its borders. It doesn't have enough defense budget. Uh, Indian army is composed of low caste who oppose the high caste officers. Uh, the Indian army doesn't have logistics support. Uh, in order to continue the military operations. Uh, they have also suggested, for instance, that China is not going to invest in India if the app ban and restrictions on infrastructure investment and others are carried forward. Forgetting for the moment that China invested $8.3 billion in all these 20, 30 years uh, for, a, for an economy which is $14 trillion, China's investment in India is $8.3 billion. That is the official figure. Uh, their investment in the CPEC projects is already $42 billion. That is five times the investment in, in India. So that is the level of the Global Times rhetoric uh, and the suggestion that they will retaliate on what India is doing in terms of protecting its territorial integrity and others. The next level is the think tanks in China and the scholarly articles in the universities. Uh, the thumb rule in China is all China scholars, all officials, all are party members, almost 100%. So 
So they serve the party state, unlike in India, unlike in Senate's K, who need not serve the state, but sometimes serve the ideas, sometimes serve the truth. Uh, in the case of China, the party state demands absolute loyalty. Uh, that makes it the analysis also clouded with irredentist claims, nationalism, and militarism. For instance, many think tanks, they produce at least 80 to 90% of their product only to the government or to the Communist Party, not to the general public even. Forget about the foreign audience. So most of the think tanks, we do not know what exactly they have suggested to the state council in order to counter the Indian positions in Ladakh. Uh, so this is one other level where, for instance, uh, many scholars in China Institutes for Contemporary International Relations, Futan University, Tsinghua University. Uh, Yan Shuetung, for instance, was in a webinar with Indian scholars and retired officials, suggesting that India forgot about the non-aligned movement and hence all the troubles for India currently. No Indian scholar raised the issue that China had forgotten communism or China started behaving highly nationalist or in highly militarism that they accused Chiang Kai-shek of following. Uh, those who participated in the webinar did not ask Yan Shui Tung why China is turning militarist. For instance, People's Daily or other newspapers carried photographs, videos, saying how Hong Chi 9, Hong Chi 7, Hong Chi 16, Hong Chi uh, 17, surface to air missile batteries can counter the Indian Air Force. Live videos have been put up in the. Secondly, they have also shown how T 15 tanks or T 99 main battle tanks can knock off Indian military positions in Ladakh. This is a display of militarism by China, which they used to criticize the Chiang Kai shek and the US and others before, yet today are practicing. China mobilized the 6th Mechanized Infantry Division from Xinjiang, 4th Mechanized Infantry Division, uh, and also has mobilized the J-20, J-11, J-10 aircraft, in addition to the Trupa helicopters. Uh, some Chinese scholars criticized the US-India connection in the military domain, forgetting for a moment that the Chinese received Black Hawk helicopters from the United States in the 1980s. Black Hawk helicopters are deployed in Tibet. While Chinese scholars keep saying that India is moving towards the US, China already moved towards the US way back in the 1980s. But the catch was 1989 Tiananmen Square resulted in American embargo on the uh, supply of arms to China. So, Professor, if I might intervene, I'll give you two more minutes, sir. Thank you very much. I will wind up. Uh, so, in other words, there is a lot of psychological warfare, militarism, nationalist, and irredentist claims by China, uh, which used to have a different model, political model before, but has been dishing out this in the recent times, not just, by the way, against India but also against Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, Kazakhstan. Uh, and a Chinese scholar also mentioned about Vladivostok belonging to that of China. Uh, some Chinese scholar claimed Manipur belonging to China. We have to see what their bills are in the future. This nationalist, uh, agenda where it will end. Will they claim Delhi? Will they claim 
West Bengal uh, in future. That is what we have to also see. By the way, some Chinese scholars also claim Hawaii uh, as part of their empire before, uh, as they are claiming Maldives, Sri Lanka, or others as part of the Middle Kingdom status. So we have to see, and this has links to the 19 party Congress agenda, which said, General Secretary Xi Jinping said, China wants to occupy the center stage. And by common sense, center stage would mean China wants to be the global hegemon. That is a rub with the Trump administration, which waged the tariff wars. That is a rub with the South China Sea claimants, as well as with Japan or currently with India. So Chinese scholars think anchored accusing India of following nationalism actually are mirror imaging, in fact, more of nationalism and militarism. China shifted from Tao Kwan Yang Hui, keeping a low profile to that of Yoso Tso Wei, accomplishing something. And that is the key problem that we are all facing, not just India, but also the entire neighborhood. So I end here by saying there is a lot of psychological warfare, three warfares, psychological, media, legal warfare that China is waging. Uh, the intensity was high during the Doklam, uh, but today it is increasing. They find no option for them to counter India in Ladakh because we are well prepared across the 3,488 kilometer long border. So the exit strategy is a problematic for China today. And so they are waging all these kinds of psychological warfare. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Dr. Samir Lalwani. Well, you, sir, he's a senior fellow, as you know, of the director of the South Asia program at the Stimson Center. And among his many accomplishments, which have been documented in this profile that we had circulated to all the invites, I wish to highlight that he is the visiting fellow at India Institute of Defense Studies and a contributing editor to War on the Rocks. His works on nuclear security protocols and his research work focused on South Asian security decision making is routinely published by most reputed journals and publications worldwide. Dr. Lalwani, you have in an article in War on the Rocks going by the heading Revelations and Opportunities what the USA can learn from the Sino-Indian crisis state. And I quote, strategists of governance, economics, and geopolitics have long known that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And the Sino-Indian border crisis, which now seems under control, is no different. Uh, Dr. Lalwani, I ask you, is the standoff at Ladakh under control, as you state, and also, Please make your case as to how the Indo-US relationship casts a shadow on the Indo-China relationship. Uh, you go on to state, and if I recollect, that the US sees this crisis as an opening to accelerate and deepen security cooperation. Dr. Lawani, please state your case. Thank you, Brigadier Mukherjee, and to um, Senators for hosting this uh, fantastic discussion. I'll try to be brief and recap a few of the points I made in that article and then maybe some extensions off of it in regards to what some of the other scholars in this uh, discussion have been uh, suggesting. So, you know, I'll start off with the first point, which is that I think by and large, uh, the strategic community in Washington, D.C., not just the South Asia watching community, but the defense community writ large, sees what's playing out over the course of this year as a real opportunity for both the United States and India. It's sharpened the divisions between China and India, something that I think um, might have been abated for a period of time, starting with the um, uh, with the, the Xi Modi um, tete a tete that began in 2018, I'm forgetting the name of it for some reason, and then uh, into 2019. There was sort of a pause even after Doklam that was unexpected, I think caught um, some, some strategic thinkers and, and decision makers here in, in the United States off guard, because it seemed like India might be equivocating or hedging. 
uh, as as this has proved much sharper over the last uh, six months with the the incursions on in Ladakh and the, and the line of actual control, I think uh, there is a sense now that the U.S. and India can and should uh, move much deeper in terms of its defense cooperation, not just in terms of formalities and processes, but in terms of hard material uh, exchanges of uh, you know hardware of um, uh, capacity building, of intelligence sharing, of coordination exercises, um, with the intention that this this is sort of heads in the direction of joint planning um, and even operations into the future. I think that has been the U.S. ambition since um, the sort of the broad strategic realignment the U.S. embarked upon in the early 2000s, uh, and I think it's coming to a head now because for, for a number of reasons. There's still a number of obstacles uh, or, or uh, challenges, I think, to sort of that vision that I'll try to discuss a little bit. One of them, though, has been talked about quite a lot, I think, in India over the last, uh, not just this year, but uh, for several years, which is its two-front problem, right? And so when you go back to the history of U.S.-India relations and several efforts by the United States to engage and partner with India, um, particularly to balance China in the 60s, um, and then some hedging behavior in the 80s as well, uh, and certainly in the early 2000s, there's a routine discussion that India has this two-front problem, and it needs to figure out a way to silence or sort of mitigate one of them so they can concentrate on the other. For a long time, um, especially in the, in the 60s, there was a discussion that India, the United States was a proponent of India settling its disputes with Pakistan because you know, Pakistan was an ally of the United States, and the two of them concentrating their efforts on balancing China. Um, if you go back to some of Secretary Rumsfeld's uh, initial thinking on this in the early 2000s, there's his, a number of his uh, writings have been declassified, even on his own website. Uh, and he talks pretty explicitly about this. If we can only get the Indians and the Pakistanis to settle their border issues, the Indians will be able to concentrate fully um, on China. So it's a routine sort of set of thinking. I think Washington has decided to move beyond this uh, concern. It, can, it no longer believes that it's going to be... Um, the ambassador of, of bridging an Indo-Pakistan Indo um, conflict resolution process, uh, maybe some mitigation efforts, but probably not going to sort of be able to be that third party broker. But it still doesn't eliminate the two front problem that India has. What a number of speakers have described today is a China that is economically more powerful, militarily more advanced, and uh, maybe doctrinally and strategically more aggressive than India. So for India to match up against that while simultaneously dealing with uh, a regional adversary that may be uh, weaker, but is still um, quite cohesive and, and organized and dedicated to resisting or even countering Indian um, ascension in the subcontinent is a real dilemma for India that I can't see a way out of. I think everyone has, uh, many, many people have articulated this two front or 2.5 front dilemma extremely well. I haven't heard a good articulation of how India reaches escape velocity out of this two front dilemma. I think the theory for a long time in Washington was that India's economic growth would propel it out of there. Uh, and that looked like that was a, a winning strategy for about a decade. Uh, but the slowdowns of whether you want to date it back to 2012 or 2017, uh, and certainly after the COVID crisis, uh, this is going to be a you know a, a rainy, remaining problem. How does India figure out not just in terms of focus, but in terms of doctrine, uh, hardware, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, the whole range of uh, of strategic uh, choices that it needs to make about whether it's going to concentrate its forces and its deterrence posture. Uh, against Pakistan or against India. Um, and that, in some ways, I don't think they are uh, synergistic. I think in, in, in many ways, the, if India believes that there is a collusive Pakistan-China two front, um, it's designed to really uh, create dilemmas for India. And I don't think the way India's force structure and doctrine and strategy are currently configured uh, is capable of wrestling with the two of them simultaneously. And so that's that's a problem. I'm, I'm describing a problem that I don't think there's, a, you know, from Washington's end, but there's no solution to it obviously yet. Uh, but it, it raises a question of whether India can even hold its own in terms of its own defense, as well as the other ambition the United States has, which is to deny China uh, power projection and influence in the region. I think um, for a period of time, India was, you know, un unquestionably the regional hegemon, and that's been challenged of late, and is going to continue to tip um, against India's favor. And so, 
the way it sort of pulls itself out of this um, counterbalancing problem where even as India rises, it generates antibodies in the region that are friendly to China uh, is going to be a significant challenge or um, net that ties India down to the region rather than allowing it to play a much larger role. So that's one sort of challenge that I'll describe. The second is uh, getting more specific to India's deterrence and defense concepts, uh, which again, I don't think I'm the first to say this. I think many astute Indian analysts have pointed this out. Uh, these deterrence and defense concepts certainly need some refinement. So the first problem that I think has been witnessed uh, over the course of the last few months is how does India hold something that China values at risk? And it's not clear to me that the way India's force structure and strategy on the line of actual control is configured, that it can really hold something that China values at risk. It can deny or attempt to deny Chinese fait accomplis or wrestle with those fait accomplis uh, and offer some sort of tit for tat uh, reprisals. It can uh, set in some, maybe some special forces across the LAC for a period of time to be disruptive, probably very close to the LAC. Uh, but it doesn't seem to have the ability to really strike hard um, at what China values. I think um, as Professor Guruswamy talked about, it can't really reach China's core, its eastern seaboard in any meaningful way uh, and do so without sort of a tremendous escalation. Not, we're not talking about sort of nuclear missiles, but in terms of just conventional forces. It can't really conduct a serious anti-access or you know, area denial campaign that limits Chinese access to the Indian Ocean and to the Middle East. These are things it could try to develop capabilities for in the future, but that would require a, a certain level of concentration and focus uh, that seems to elude India in part because it's spread out its resources uh, and its sort of constrained resources or over a number of fronts, both sort of east and west, as well as a number of distinct strategies, whether punishment, denial, um, or holding. So I think that's one dilemma that uh, that frustrates sort of Indian deterrence strategy. I think at the end of the day, there is a consensus that India wants to be able to have the capacity to punish China, and it's building up the means or acquiring some of the means to do so, whether in terms of uh, you know some of the uh, advanced precision standoff and, and, and speedy capabilities in terms of cruise missiles, in terms of long range uh, strike platforms. Uh, but the connecting those two dots between sort of these basic means and the ends of punishment requires a certain set of strategic concepts that I don't think have really evolved in India. Uh, whether are they is this going to be a missile campaign that tries to deny China the ability to control Tibet or try to control uh, Xinjiang? Is this uh, meant to sort of interdict Chinese logistics from getting to the front in the LAC? Uh, and these are all you know, decisions that have to be made because there's an economy of force here where China always will have more missiles and more aircraft than India. So India has to pick a track and a strategy. And it can't simply just have it secret in its in its war plans. There has to be some signaling of this because the purpose of this is to deter China, to pr prevent China from even thinking about starting something on the LAC. And that signaling, and I think I would even argue maybe that thinking is, is perhaps absent right now. The last point I'll make, which is maybe a little bit more of a, a thought experiment or a question that I've been wrestling with right now, um, is a question of risk taking. So from the DC perspective, one of the big um, breakthroughs, I think, in the US defense strategy over the last few years is uh, the national defense strategy that was published in the beginning of 2018. And the reason it's received um, applause, not only by sort of the administration backers, but even by opponents and critics of it, is because the strategy made very clear choices and accepted risks and trade-offs. And it was explicit about where it's gonna accept risks, both functionally and regionally, uh, and, and the reasons for that. So it had a very clear prioritization and strategic logic. The question I've always wondered is where is India willing to accept risk in its broader grand strategy or defense strategy? Uh, the problem that many of you have laid out, including Professor Guruswami, talked about sort of this problem of economic constraints, while also sort of a much, much more difficult neighborhood and a very threatening adversary. And when you try to navigate this, I think you have sort of three options. You either find a way to settle one of your borders or to reduce or sort of achieve a modus vivendi on it, or perhaps both, in order to, to build economic power and husband military power over the course of the long term. Another option is sort of a, a very acute form of, of internal balancing where you reduce the guns versus butter dilemma by essentially getting cheaper guns. 
you by you able to continue to invest in the economy and economic development and choose a much more efficient route of defense, which is, I think, again, eluded in India because of, in, you know, inter-service rivalries, bureaucratic hurdles, uh, but also sort of just a, a, a paralysis over what direction it's going to go in terms of uh, its strategy vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular opponent. Um, and or you do this by allying with a partner that's willing to give a discounted rate to those guns or to those sort of advanced platforms, whether it's about strike platforms or ISR capabilities or a whole slew of other uh, capacities that would allow for sort of focus and concentrated deterrence. The third is, again, sort of another sort of partnership strategy, which is to reduce the guns versus butter trade up by um, basically selling, uh, hosting guns uh, in exchange for butter. Uh, and this is obviously a strategy that India does not want to do about granting access in terms of, you know, access to military bases or to its territory for power projection by another great power. But it is, it's an option that has to be considered. The point is these are, none of these are appealing options, but that's the point of strategy is to make some hard choices. And it's, it's always uh, befuddled me as to what sort of those risks or those choices India is going to make in the future as, as the future gets a little more challenging. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lalwani. That was an excellent disposition and a very fair analysis of India and USA's present relationships. Especially, one can see why China is uneasy with this relationship. India has to figure out a way to be friends with both USA and Russia. Thank you once again, Dr. Lalwani. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Air Chief Marshal Arup Raha, who retired as Chief of Air Staff and Chairman of Chiefs of Staff Committee on 31st of December 2016. Now, ACM Raha has been president of our organization and is presently a widely respected voice in forums which debate domestic and international issues, which specifically encompasses an armed forces perspective. Air Chief Marshal, you have been a protagonist of a policy of mutual trust and benefit that India and China could contribute to break the stranglehold of the Western powers in a unipolar world. Uh, in this pandemic environment, please state your case as also, may I request you to hypothecate a conflict scenario and the role of the aerospace power therein. ACM, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you very much. I hope you all can hear me. Oh yes sir, we can. Right. Uh, first of all, my warm greetings of the day to all the eminent speakers and the distinguished participants in this webinar. Indochina relations cannot be seen in isolation. It has to be seen through the prism of a wider view of China's relationship with the rest of the world. So I am going to first briefly cover about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which originated, this virus originated in China, on the strategic security of the world as such, and hence related to rise of China and now its belligerence, which affects its relationship with the rest of the world. And then I'll go on to the Indochina confrontation in Ladakh and what Air Force or aerospace role could be in case of a conflict. So firstly, the one virus pandemic would leave scars in many you know, spheres, in many dimensions, physical, psychological, financial, societal, and even military confrontation as collateral effect. Nations are bracing up for the changes that you know, <clears throat> their people across the world have to adopt and adapt to, ushering in major changes in our security outlook as well as in our lifestyle. Secondly, the strategic security of most nations have been breached, including the rich and the powerful, without firing a single bullet because of this pandemic. The overall comprehensive national power, the CNP, has been adversely affected. The military power has not diminished in uh, immediate term to protect these nations sovereignty, but in the middle term and long term, you know, it is going to have a very adverse effect because of the economic footprint of the pandemic that has been affected tremendously. Funding for military 
capabilities and projects would take a direct hit for several years in the future. Since the savings would be plowed into meeting more competing and urgent demands of healthcare, infrastructure development, revival of devastated economies, and other welfare schemes for the disadvantaged sections of our society, like the migrant laborers in India, who are part of the unorganized sector. Thirdly, in the global village with excellent connectivity, the effectiveness of the pandemic control mechanism has come into question, especially the role of World Health Organization in the delay in advising the world on the virulence of the contagion and effective measures to prevent its spread. This lapse, most of the people think that it can be fixed on the opaque handling of the one virus and more or less irresponsible behavior of China. The world's reaction indicates mistrust and isolation of China. It is so evident now. The Chinese people all across the globe are facing persecution because the huge failure of CPC leadership in Beijing in preventing the spread of the virus in the early stages of its detection in Wuhan. And the conspiracy theory, which is gaining ground, is that the virus was produced in the lab in Wuhan itself. That's beside the point. Fourthly, the world's vulnerability in terms of over-dependence on China, which is the world's manufacturing hub, has been exposed. The US, under the leadership of two well-known India haters, President Nixon and his NSA, Henry Kissinger, ushered China into the world economy in 1972, facilitated by Pakistan bringing an end to China's isolation. It was actually a calculated strategic initiative by the US, firstly, to inject market economy into China and kill communism. Secondly, to strengthen China against its rival, the USSR, though both these countries are communist regimes, but they are a dagger drawn so as to weaken and ensure the demise of Soviet Union, which happened much later and because of many other reasons. And lastly, to reap the benefit of trade with China by importing cheap goods to the US. So the US was instrumental in turning China into the manufacturing hub of the world. The greed of the developed world and later the developing nations in cheap goods from China by outsourcing everything to China has jeopardized the strategic autonomy of the whole world, all nations. And it has been very evident during this you know, pandemic. The corrective actions are already under implementation by major powers to plug their over-dependence on a regime which is opaque, authoritarian, and oppressive with little regard for international laws, rules, conventions, press freedom, etc. So these Remedial measures are firstly, relocation of industry, production centers and supply chains from China to other competitive destinations across the world, including India. The US, the J Japan, Australia, the European Union and others across the world are <clears throat> have declared the intentions uh, very clearly, including state funding for such relocation. Second, Boycott of Chinese goods by public in general, if not as government policy, has started because of the mistrust in anything that is Chinese post this pandemic. Thirdly, outsourcing to China would diminish progressively as alternative supply chains get operational in the next few years. China's economy would be hit adversely when demand for its goods dwindle now and in the future. Fourthly, China's investment abroad and hostile takeover of premier companies in a depressed market induced by the pandemic are being prevented by most governments. Chinese companies 
especially in communication and IT, are being rejected in the bid to capture the world market. There are other strategic changes which are taking place all across because of this pandemic. Firstly, many of the projects of the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, have actually stalled as an after effect of the current economic slowdown. The affected nations have grown suspicious of Chinese intentions. It may result in maybe a collapse of the BRI in the future, a flagship project of Xi Jinping overshadowing the famous Marshall Plan of the US post World War II, which was designed to revive the world economy under US leadership. Secondly, the BRI funding and other projects under Chinese control have created vassal states. These states are reeling under debt trap. The Chinese state sponsored companies executing these projects have a vice like grip over these nations, exploiting their economic vulnerabilities. The predatory practice and selfish intentions are creating friction instead of gratitude towards China. There is a huge wave of anger and angst among nations in Africa and Asia against exploitation by China of the natural resources like minerals, timber, etc., through corrupt practices resulting in unprecedented ecological and environmental degradation. So these issues have gained actual traction now after the pandemic has broken out. Thirdly, China's dream of superpower status may take much longer now to materialize. In fact, the collapse of the CPC authority with pro-democracy movement gaining ground in Hong Kong, revolt against suppression of dissidents and oppression of the ethnic minorities in Tibet and Xinjiang is very much on the cards. It may happen sooner than later than you can think of. The pandemic-induced momentum may result in a change of guard in Beijing. And of course, there may be some changes in the CPC, maybe ushering in uh, a democratic, democratic regime uh, with a benign outlook uh, towards the world affairs. We all know that communism has failed all across the world and authoritarian regimes do not survive long. Take the example of you know, balkanization of the USSR and Yugoslavia in the recent past. China may follow the same route. China has worked on long-term strategy to lead the world as a superpower, leveraging its economic and military prowess. It includes winning five campaigns or conflicts by 2050 as enunciated by their own you know, a strategic analyst. It includes integration of Taiwan, gaining control of the Senkaku Islands uh, from Japan and East China Sea, annexation of territories in Mongolia and Russia, adjacent to former Manchurian state of China, and lastly, annex Arunachal Pradesh, which is Southern Tibet, as they call it. This arrogance of power is reflected in their aggressiveness. They are following actually the hegemon the US as they had behaved in the past. The blatant policy that you are either with us or against us and suffer our wrath if you do not fall in line. China is attempting to wrest control of world institutions which have dominated, which has been dominated by the US and Western powers, but they are liberal democracies. It's quite different from an opaque authoritarian communist regime like China. It is working very hard to change the unipolar world led by the US to bipolar world with China as the other pole. Perfectly all right. But they do not accept that the world should be multipolar, which is more desirable for balancing global affairs. China actually has disdain for the aspirations of a big neighbor like India, for its economy, for its culture, for its civilization, and for its people, for its soft power a nation with one sixth the population of the world and is a rising economic power. It doesn't want India to be another pole, not in the world, not even in Asia. So the CPC is in an overdrive and behaving, I think, belligerently through orchestration of military clashes with the little states in the SCAS, ECAS 
and of course along the LSE in the Himalayas. So it is not very strange that they are behaving uh, the way they are currently when the world is reeling under pandemic originating in China. So China's aggressive behavior to my mind is aimed at containing its fallout of various factors amongst its own people in the country. First, unprecedented angst in the world against China for the Wuhan virus pandemic. Culpability of China becomes obvious when it did not permit discussion in the UNSC on this pandemic right in the beginning, though it later relented after four months. Second, intensification of trade war and sanctions against China by the US, which is the fallout of frustrations over unusual trade imbalance, malpractices, and stealing of technologies from USA. Pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong have turned extensive and intensive defying Beijing's authority. So CPC is playing to the gallery for internal audience to divert the attention from the crisis of national dispute. It is aimed at propping up a narrative to portray the CPC leadership in good light and the invincibility of Xi Jinping to achieve glory for China. Okay, <clears throat> now I'll come to um, uh, the, my take on Indian response to the Chinese belligerence in Ladakh. I think India would have to prepare for a long haul. And the Chinese hostility towards it would intensify progressively. India cannot hope for reciprocation of one China policy with one India policy from China. India has remained assiduously silent because of China's sensitivity on many issues, be it Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Tibet, and so many more. But an all out conflict or war is not likely in the Himalayan region because it would be a lose lose situation for both. Both the countries. Sorry to interrupt. You have two more minutes to go, sir. Okay, thank you. Oh, there is too much actually at stake to be sacrificed for desolate mountainous terrain in the Himalayas. Hence, all efforts will be made to prevent such a conflict. However, a limited border conflict in Ladakh cannot be ruled out. Chinese aggression and ex expansionism is being thwarted you know, by resolute military, economic, strategic, and diplomatic maneuvers by India. I can tell you the Indian Army and the Indian Air Force are better prepared may not be stronger than China, than the PLA forces. In terms of combat training, we are better off. Professionalism, leadership, combat exposure, and over and above that morale. It will be a fight between professionals and conscripts. You can draw your own conclusion about the outcome. The use of IAF will certainly tilt the balance in favor of India due to various reasons which I'll answer during the question hour session. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, the current standoff with China is a challenge which needs to be converted into an opportunity by India to reverse the narrative of appeasement and self-restraint, always giving into Chinese sensitivities. It's time India calls a spade a spade on all issues and stop the bully in its track. The whole world is watching India to succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for really highlighting the arrogance of power of China. There's also the causes of their present aggressive behavior at this stage due to the COVID-19 accusations that it faces. You have put it all so very succinctly. Thank you, Chief. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Madam Yunsun. She is a senior fellow and co-director of the East Asia program and director of the China program at the Stimson Center. Madam Sun's expertise lies in examining and analyzing Chinese behavior, its policies and its national security decision-making processes, as also its relations with its neighbors. During her presentation today, Madam Sin, Sun will focus on China's changing threat perceptions of India and the policy options being discussed in China regarding India. Madam Sun, please present your case. Thank you and good evening everybody. It's a true honor to be here. 
And I have learned a lot from the uh, presentation so far. Um, as a China analyst, I will present what I observe as China's changing threat perceptions of India, as well as the military options that are being discussed or the strategic options that are being discussed in China as for how China should deal with India down the road. Um, these are my personal views and they reflect what I believe is China's position. So um, they're not my, my position. So I'll just put it out there to begin with. So um, a couple of things that, um, that, that from the observation uh, of the presentation so far, I think a lot of it has, of course, uh, everything to do with how history is interpreted and how the LAC is drawn and, and the uh, different lines were drawn, who accepted what line uh, at what point. So I think fundamentally, I was, I was thinking when these uh, disputes were discussed, I was thinking that while well, the Chinese interpretation of history is is fundamentally different from the Indian Indian interpretation, especially for the period of the, the colonial period where um, India was colonized by by the British and China was colonized by multiple countries. I think for for the Chinese when they look at the colonial experience, they are a total they're a sheer loser from the colonial experience, and they see that India as a beneficiary of that colonial experience. And this is um, reflected in the, in the border issue. So in the colonial experience, China lost sovereignty, China lost territory. But in the Chinese view, what India gained from that experience is territory and also the unity, so-called unity of a, of a nation, nation state. So I think this almost psychological and philosophical difference anchors how India interprets different lines along the border and how the Chinese interpret different lines. Because when the Chinese look at the lines, they see, they see a peer, uh, uh, 100 years of uh, victimization, they see national humiliation, and they see that the sovereign government of China either is Qing Dynasty or is, um, or is the ROC government or is a PRC government has never accepted the legality of, for example, the Johnson line. But then I guess a counter argument can be made that, that what China drew in the South China Sea, the 11 Daesh line in uh, drawn by KMT government in 1947 was also not, not recognized by any claimant countries in the region at that point. But then the, I guess the Chinese reaction is, well, back in 1947, there weren't really sovereign states in, um, in Southeast Asia. At least Vietnam was not one. So looking at the, the problems between China and India, there are certainly many problems. And I think border disputes could be regarded as, the, as a reason why these uh, issues between China and India are so, so um, deeply entrenched and that does not afford an easy solution. But on the other hand, I also think that the border issue is also the result of the mounting distrust of the, uh, the problems between China and India. So it's both the cause and the effect of the relationship between the two countries. And I think when we look at why um, China and India have had so, such a turbulent relationship, um, I think a fundamental reason is because of the power structure in the, in the Asia region, or more specifically in the South Asia subregion that these are two great powers coexisting in one area and it inevitably gets into the competition as for uh, whether South Asia, for example, is ex exclusively India's sphere of influence. So that's one reason. The second reason is, uh, like as many presenters have talked about this, the domestic politics in, in, in China Xi Jinping's nationalism and Xi Jinping's uh, assertiveness and his, uh, his ambition. But I think on the other hand, from the Chinese observation, they also see the same domestic political factor in India related to Prime Minister Modi's, for example, his Hindu nationalism or the conservative political trend in India. And the third factor, of course, is the external alignment issue that um, although the Chinese don't believe that India has formed an alliance with the United States, they, they do see this alignment with the United States uh, growing quite, quite quickly. And if you look at the strategic context, I think China, face, China recognizes that it, it has a dilemma on India. And it originates from the 
asymmetry between China and India in their security priorities. So for India, uh, China, or maybe Pakistan, as some people would argue, um, as a primary threat. And China only sees India as a secondary challenge because China's priority unequivocally lies in the West, Western Pacific. And because India is not China's primary threat and South Asia is not China's primary theater, China would prefer to save on costs and minimize military and strategic resources on India. If a, conflict, if a conflict is unavoidable for China, China could mobilize to an overwhelming capacity to achieve a decisive victory on the battlefield. But China doesn't want it because that victory will not help to alleviate or improve China's key security challenge in the Pacific. So the desire for China to avoid a two-front war in the Western Pacific and South Asia has long anchored China's preference in its border disputes with, uh, with India. However, for the Chinese, the pattern of the border in interactions with India and also the issue of diplomacy with India in recent years reflects an Indian desire to capitalize on this asymmetry and the imbalance in their priorities and resolve. Since the beginning of the standoff in the Gulf Valley, many Indian strategists have posed this question that, that raised the question about the wisdom of China's actions, given China's culpability in the COVID-19 pandemic and the free fall of relations with the US and the deteriorating relationship with China's neighbors. So why is China doing this? Is this really wise for China to pick a fight with India at this moment? But I think the message that the Chinese hear from these, this line of questioning is that it suggests an Indian conviction of an Indian position of strength and consequently an Indian expectation for Chinese concessions. So these perceptions may very well possibly be misperceptions, but they do deeply entrench the views that most likely will influence their interactions down the road. So I will not get into uh, who did what and who's right or who's wrong in the, uh, in the, in the, in the Ladakh crisis. I will just focus on the, the consequence of it. What has it, what has it done to, um, to the mutual distrust and the mutual threat perceptions of each other between China and India. So evidently the Ladakh crisis has um, exacerbated both the Chinese and Indian threat perceptions of each other. So some might argue, and in fact, a lot of the Chinese do argue that there's no love lost because uh, there was no love to begin with. Given the longstanding issues between the two and the deeply embedded distrust of each other's strategic intentions, However, distrust and problems are fundamentally different from hostility and the confrontation. So because uh, hostility and confrontation would suggest active policies to undermine the other side. So China's assessment of India as a secondary threat and South Asia as a secondary theater has now changed. And it is unlikely to change in the future unless there is a dramatic change of the environment. However, the events this year have forced China to come face to face with a long list of factors in a real scenario of a war with India. And this includes a heightened and sustained escalation of tension, the growing possibility of a real military conflict and the military planning, mobilization, preparation necessitated by it, as well as the Indian willingness to let the border issues spill over to bilateral economic and trade relations. So more importantly, I think the two front war scenario has forced China to face the reality that any of its actions on Taiwan would trigger Indian, what the Chinese call adventurism along the disputed border. Just like the Chinese believe that the Indian border movement this year capitalized on China's weaknesses and distraction due to the COVID-19. Although India remains a secondary threat in China's playbook, the needle of China's policy towards India has moved. If anything, China's tolerance for a bad relationship with India, including a conflict if imposed, has increased. This is categorically different from the previous conviction that China is and will always be risk averse and therefore would avoid a conflict with India at all costs. It doesn't mean that China will actively seek a war with India, but it does suggest that China is prepared to defend its military positions, even if a conflict is inevitable. Bluffs are and will be called 
and China will not be the paper tiger some Indians have inferred from the outcome of the, of the dot com crisis. There might be, well, a lot of people ask this question that, well, what does that take to fix the relationship? And I think a lot of people have put their hope on an intervention by the senior leaders, by Xi Jinping and Modi. Like Samir mentioned, the Wuhan summit, very bromatic um, uh, encountering between the two leaders. So there might be a temporary fix if the top leaders of the two countries decide to step in and press the reset button like they did back in 2018. However, I would like to argue that the abrupt and short-lived nature of that post dot rapprochement in 2018 and a little bit of 2019 illustrates how fragile and unsustainable such quick fixes will be. The hard and realistic conflict between China and India over their history, territory, trade, regional status, and historical destiny are too deep to remove easily. So maybe the best we can hope is to manage them without getting into a disastrous war. So if these, if these are China's threat perception and the Chinese assessment, what are some of the options that the Chinese have talked about? I divide them into three categories. So it's the first mover, second mover, and the last one is uh, winning without fighting using Sun Tzu and the, the Chinese military philosophy. So these are the basically the three options that are laid out on the on the table. Option one dictates that China be the first mover and a war that ends wars. So as a hawks in China would like to see, Beijing should finally strengthen its resolve and take the initiative to deter India with a war that ends wars, just like it did in 1962. So for them, India's growing domestic Hindu nationalism and the inflated sense of empowerment by the favorable external environment from factors including the Indo-Pacific strategy have enabled a significantly more ambitious and provocative policy towards India, uh, towards China. And in their view, this trend is only likely to continue and accelerate as Indian leaders might desire a foreign crisis to divert domestic attention away from the failures on COVID-19 and the 23.9% economic contraction during the second quarter this year. So to these Chinese, if China were to back off currently in the, in the Western sector of their disputed border, it will only confirm to India that China's reluctant and the war unable to counter India. Hence, it will invite more aggressive behaviors from India down the road. This proposal is also closely linked to the development in the West Pacific, especially on Taiwan. China has been fraught over the deepening ties between US and Taiwan this year. And during this free fall period of US-China relations, the major arms sales package and senior US government officials visit of Taiwan have put rising constraints or, or rising pressure on China's needed action. As it prepares for its options, especially the military options that it enjoys vast popular support in China, the possibility and danger of a potential two-front war in the East and the West at the same time is becoming increasingly real. So if China is going to plan and act on a Taiwan contingency, the argument is that the need to tie up the loose end in this Western theater becomes even more pressing than before. Second option, which is what I call the second mover assertiveness. So despite the popularity of the first option among nationalists and some corners of the policy apparatus in China, the more realistic option remains anchored on China's reactive nature or the reactive nature of the Chinese assertiveness. So China will not be the first mover, but instead China will react as a second mover. So as a second mover, China will make a full preparation for a potential conflict with India. But instead of initiating a war, China will only react, but forcefully and resolutely to an Indian act of provocation in the Chinese view. Being the second mover rather than the provo provocateur is expected to confer China some sense of moral high ground, especially if the diplomatic efforts have been exhausted by that time. The essence of a second mover strategy lies in China's confidence. I think one of the previous presenters mentioned this, lies in China's confidence that it, ha it has the financial resources, military capacity, and domestic political consensus to sustain and prevail in a protracted standoff. 
of or a war of attrition vis-a-vis -vis India. It reflects China's preference for peace, but also its resolve to fight a war if need be. So China's 1916, uh, 1962 war with India and 1979 war with Vietnam both demonstrated the central position of this, of this belief and the essence of the self-defense war concept in China's military doctrine. So if the border standoff continues or escalates, this will most likely be the, uh, uh, be the eventual scenario. Option three, winning without fighting. So that's the Chinese traditional military wisdom by Sun Tzu. So in the long term and strategic perspective, China's most desired option to settle the disputes and the relations with India is winning without fighting. And this conviction is reflected in China's consistent effort to resort, resort back to diplomacy to manage the border disputes with India in the past decades. The logic of this option lies in the belief that the power gap between China and India will only grow with China's rise. And there will be a day that the power balance becomes so large that India will recognize the impracticality and the impossibility of his desired endgame. Following this vein, then and only then will the Indian willingness to negotiate a pragmatic solution to the border disputes emerge. This diplomacy-based approach put a band-aid on the most dividing and disturbing issue between the two great powers in the region. And its utility and effectiveness have come under increasing questioning as both sides try to defend their military positions on the front line. More importantly, the most fundamental problem with this approach for the Chinese even, is that if China has to concede control of territory today, then that concession removes the premise and the need for this desired future outcome anyway. Considering China's economic slowdown and India's improving international status, such a future victory is nowhere guaranteed anymore in the Chinese playbook. So therefore... Can I well, in the next few minutes? Understood. Thank you, sir. So therefore, while this policy had in the past been prominent in Beijing's decision making vis-a-vis -vis Delhi on the border issue, the development after Daklam has increasingly undermined its premise. So uh, there are a lot of people probably outside China and India who have questioned the value of the military posts in the remote uh, habitable Himalayan mountains. While the strategic value might be questionable, or at a minimum debatable, there are deeply entrenched emotional, political, legal, historical, and military considerations on both sides that have hindered the practical solution. So confrontations, standoffs, and incidents will likely become more regular as the two sides consolidate their line of actual control in the Western sector until there is no more ambiguity or no more room for imagination regarding their actual positions. And that future line of actual control will serve as a foundation and the beginning of a real border negotiation between China and India. So if you ask me if there's any silver lining from all the tension that has happened and all the tension to come, I would say that might be it. Thank you, sir. I will stop there and look forward to, to the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for an excellent presentation. And you made a most telling observation. There are two large neighbors and ancient civilizations. Yet throughout history, as we see it, there has hardly been very close interaction between each other. And like you mentioned, there is one love lost between these two nations. And you touched upon most everything that exists in the relationship between our two countries and the options that we have. I think a very, very good presentation, ma'am. Thank you once again. Our next and last speaker is Major General Arun Roy. He's the Vice President of Senna's K. General Roy has been our military attache in Washington, had a long stint in the USSR to train on anti-tank missiles armament systems, and subsequently visited China with official delegations. He has commanded the Dokalam Brigade, incidentally, in the northern borders during the mid-90s and has been the MGGS of Headquarter Eastern Command, which primarily looks after the security of the Northeastern region. General Roy wishes to touch upon some very significant aspects of the Indo-China conflict 
some aspects have already been touched upon yet the historical issues related to the border and ladakh factoring in a tibet and reasons why china is now shifting the loc to its advantage will be touched upon in passing i request general roy to also factor in pakistan and the collusion of both pak and china against the backdrop of brick and present economic situation as it obtains for both nations general roy the floor is yours <clears throat> thank you very much my greetings to all my panelists and especially a big thank you to the two panelists from stimson organization in washington for taking up the rigors of early morning uh most of the points have been touched however i will just go into a little issue of the border and the historical aspects of these to start with let us take the joint statement from moscow which took place a few days ago uh you will notice that it referred to border issues for the first time conspicuously the word lsc was missing this is a significant change since the two have a different connotation also far reaching implications india's negotiation strategy thus has serious lacunae further in the statements issued by each side china has never mentioned the restoration of status quo ante but restoring peace and tranquility in border areas the word lsc has also never been used by them indian side too has also not used the word in a formal statement of the restoration of status quo ante in formal statements but called for a full and complete disengagement now here lies the rub now i want to come to the border issues henry mcmohan was the first person who came up with the issue of delimitation and demarcation now with this difference of delimitation which is actually a description of the border along boundary principle features and demarcation which means basically boundary pillars which never came up in our northern areas northern borders and that is where the whole issue arose the uh, most of the panelists have talked to the various of uh, the various lines in aksai chain so i will not go through them but aksai chain was considered as part of colonial india on the other hand the chinese claims go back to the king empire consequently if indians went that far back all of southern and parts of southeast asia would be claimed by india indians claims are now based basically or inherited based on the boundaries of its colonial masters we have not gotten beyond that the line of actual control in the absence of demarcated border functions more like a line liable to shift accordingly according to who is present occupant of that portion of land for instance indian troops have no maps of the line of actual control as given or defined by the chinese only perceptions this is undoubtedly a serious failure for those who have been negotiating with china thus the root issue is the absence of a demarcated border perceptions of loc is a faulty methodology to lay down a frontier nevertheless india's defense minister reportedly said on 15th of this month that border issues remain unresolved an american researcher mr alistair lamb who has done considerable research on india china border remarked in 1964 that the extent of chinese claims seem to increase slightly from time to time he used the word slightly we use the words salami slicing in the western sector there are three chinese claim lines in the western sector which has already been discussed by my previous panelists but what remains is the line of 7 november 1959 as a claim line which the chinese still want to actually even at the cost of using coercive diplomacy lay down uh chinese the china's global times has repeatedly said that india must accept the 1959 line or else face war uh one aspect is definitely worse today than in 1962 in the 1990s it was decided to close down the mes 
historical division. I think uh, Professor Kundapalli and Professor Mohan Guruswami will know about that. On the basis that it was not required, it was thought that the all-knowing officers of the foreign ministry understood everything and did not need to be briefed on the history, historical intricacies of any particular situation. Since then, MEA does not have a historical division and the boundary cell is only manned by a very junior army officer of the rank of a major. Uh, to be fair, China did go back 20 kilometers behind the line of actual control in the eastern sector in 1962. That is Arunachal Pradesh, but not in the western sector, where they reinforced their 1960 claim line. The Chinese message was clear. Accept our claims on the western sector, and we may accept the McMahon line. It was a hint that China gave at various meets, but never spoke about it openly in black and white. Neville Maxwell, while criticizing India for his forward policy, remained tight-lipped about China establishing forward posts beyond the 1956 claim line. Thus, I think he accepted a different claim lines put forth by China in the Western sector. Therefore, to say that the entire Aksai chain was under Chinese direction may not be correct. Nevertheless, status quo has been drastically changed by China. If China's reality, if the reality is China's different claim lines together with the Shan Saran report of 2013 and Professor Ambassador P.S. Tobdan's study is to be believed, Ladakh has been shrinking inside and India must be watchful for similar flashpoints in all along the border. But this is a little perspective on the border that I wanted to cover a little to be a little more explicit. Now let's talk about the BRI and the economic situation which most panelists have touched upon. Infrastructure lies at the heart of China's expansive ambitions of Belt and Road Initiative. It remains only a part of it. From starting in 2015 today, 40% of the BRI projects are adversely affected and a further 30 or even 40% have been somewhat affected. The economics and politics of BRI inevitably are closely intervened. While infrastructure lies at the BRI's heart, it is geography. It is the geography which has changed. With Latin America and the Polar Silk Route added in 2017 and 18, respectively, to what was previously a preeminently Asian, Middle Eastern, and African only program. Now, there is a digital Silk Road launched in 2015, which allows China to accelerate the digital digitization, thus accessing data, which is of the utmost importance in today's world. In its drive for common destiny, China faces international pushback, leaving digital diplomacy and international relations outcome undetermined. China is focused both on soft and hot power implications of building access to and controlling an increasing slew of world's data. It is thus clear that BRI goes beyond just pure economics. It is grander design, its grander design is to along with China's expansion of bilateral relationship with nations and of its institutional presence in both existing and new global institutions, change of the world order for China's benefit. Now, the present military situation has been already talked about and was already being written about in large extent. What I want to state here that mention of Depsang has somewhat become taboo. China has violated all border protocols, especially the 1993 and 1996 agreements. What has happened presently is 940 square kilometers of areas which were border, which was patrolled by India, is not being able to be patrolled at the present moment. China has already imposed costs by forcing the Indian Army to deploy huge amount of forces in high altitude. It seems, as MS Yunsen brought about, it seems prepared to press on its claims and deployments 
in a game of blink. It has mobilized four out of its five theater commands to grapple with the inimical fronts in East China Sea, South China Sea, Taiwan, and the Xinjiang and Tibet borders facing India. But as also stated by her, I don't think China has any intention of starting a conflict because for the simple reason, it is already a satisfied power. It has already got what it desires. In passing, I would like to talk about Tibet a little bit. Tibet is an issue which has not been touched about by others. If Tibet remained a free country, it would today have been the 10th largest country in the world in terms of area with 25 lakh square kilometers of land. The Tibetan plateau holds 46,000 glaciers, which is one fourth of the world's total. It's a major source of many rivers and is dotted by thousands of lakes, which serve as the origin of some of the biggest and longest rivers in Asia. It is shocking that such a reservoir of water and natural resources in Asia has been occupied by China and there has not been a strong word of protest against it. After India gained independence from Britain in 1947, the new Indian government wrote to the then Tibetan government in exile, asking whether it would like to commence a new relationship with the Indian government. In hindsight, it is clear today that this was a golden opportunity for Tibet to establish itself as an independent country recognized by India. Incredibly, the Tibetan government failed to seize this opportunity. The only excuses that one can think of are one, that at that time, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama was a 12 year old boy and the country was run by a regent in 1947. And two, during this crucial three year period after India gained independence and before China invaded Tibet, Tibetans were fighting among themselves in the civil war between the Tibet government and the Sira monastery. Tibetans, however, believe that a day will come when China will have to free Tibet. India and Tibet are bound by their geography and mutual interest for an independent Tibet. Tibet for its own sake and India for the protection of its 4,000 kilometer long northern area country with 2,147 years of recorded history cannot simply vanish into thin airs within 70 years of Chinese occupation. To begin with, Tibet must be given an observer status like Palestine at UN. India being the country culturally closest to Tibet and having given refuge to the Tibetans can take up the cause of Tibet. India has tacitly supported Tibet so far, but it needs to come out in the open. And the start point can be that replace the word Indochina border with India-Tibet border. And the second by giving a Bharat Ratna to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. <clears throat> now, come to the, coming to the point, why China has done whatever it has done? I am not using deliberately the word attack. China wants to dominate the world. For that, they have to dominate their own backyard first. Unless India submits to China, the Chinese will never become a true superpower. But why should India submit to China today or at any time in future? In 10 years, we look forward to being the third largest economy of the world. And I think... Right, sir. If I might just intervene. You have two yes. more minutes to go, sir. That you gave me 15 minutes. Okay. Border is the biggest agenda for China at the point of time. China believes that it has reached the stage where a resolution is a must. Therefore, for it, peace and stability in the neighborhood is the top priority for India. Since India is also ramping up its border infrastructure, that is what has got China worried. It is something, it has something to do with India's close coordination with the Quad and India Pacific strategy too. The Indian Navy due to its geographical access to various choke points is worrisome to China. The Chinese fears originate from Tibet becoming a union territory and our infrastructure development in Ladakh is one of the causes of biggest worry for her. In words of another Chinese strategist, Yun Guo Ming, Rather than winning a war, as MS Yunsen said, China would aim at attaining a comprehensive and overwhelming advantage in geopolitics vis-a-vis -vis India, which cannot be altered by a war. What are the options for India? In post-corona world, as the ACM brought out, we'll present new reality.
possibilities and challenges. It is imperative that potential adversaries do not see any weakness in our resolve. To this end, Indian military must remain equal to the challenges. As far as since Brigadier Mukherjee asked me to talk about Pak collision, the Pak China relationship has been that of a master slave relationship. China never intervened when Pakistan India fought a war, but I can assure you that will not be the case in case of Pakistan, because Pakistan will have to listen to what its master say. The collaborative state between China and Pakistan appear evident with what is happening in Gilgit and Baltistan. So the airports of Totok and Skardu are already with them. Now, Indian thought. India cannot project military weakness and lack of resolve to China at any cost. India will have to learn to live with informal summits with China on the one hand, increasingly risky standoffs. The Kalapani issue has already been brought out. Now, what can we do? Let us recognize Tibet government in exile. Let us send an ambassador to Taiwan. Many others, I can assure you, will follow. Let us see what China does. What are the Chinese options in that case? Go to war with India? Both shall lose in long terms. In long terms of money, men, material, honor. No territorial game. Be limited area battle area? The loser will start another battle where he feels he can win. And may lead to war. Look for an exit strategy. Get back to peace locations beyond status quo ante. Our dissuasive ability is obviously low. Leveraging China out entails great cost and risk in case of dialogue, in case the dialogue fails. This, this situation should never have arisen. To end this, I would like to quote something. Clausewitz said that war is politics by other means. Mao Zedong said war is politics with bloodshed and politics is war without bloodshed. Both sides never mentioned the important factor of bureaucracies in between. In authoritarian regimes like, <coughs> like China and Pakistan, there is, <coughs> there is no political military fusion. Bureaucracy merely executes or is executed. However, in India, a unique troika of political, military and bureaucratic leadership manages military affairs. This our leadership structure is costing India dearly. I end my talk here, Nilu. I hope I've managed this thing. I've left out a lot, but then that is it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for at least sticking to time because we have time constraints, as you know, and we are running five minutes beyond our time schedule. I notice that there is no questions at this moment in the chat box. Uh, but there are some questions which have come up in my WhatsApp post, which was open or anyone who among the participants would like to ask questions. But before that, if there are any viewers who I can notice have come up in, in between who would like to ask a question, they can activate their cameras and raise their hand. And I will, as the admin here, unmute them so that they can ask their questions. If there are anybody amongst the viewers. I would like to add one or two things, Nilu, if I may. Uh, sir, just a minute for anyone to come up and ask questions because there are two questions already there in my WhatsApp chat, one for you and one for General Shankar Roy Chaudhary, which I will uh, give you an opportunity to also articulate some other points that you would like to make. Right, I don't think so. Anybody at this moment is coming up. Or probably shying away from asking a question. The two that's come up to me in the white uh, WhatsApp chat is the first one is to General Shankar Roy Chaudhary. Sir, can you hear me, sir? Unmute yourself, sir. Shankar Roy Chaudhary, sir, unmute you, yourself, sir. Yolanda? Yolanda? Unmute your mic. Okay, sir, we can hear you. Please speak. I can, you can hear me now? Yes, yes sir. sir. I can and see you also, sir. The question is for you, sir. Yes. It says that delineating the LSE and then finally getting on to demarcation of the IB between India and China will mean give and take. Negotiations cannot take off under the cloud of parliamentary resolutions in India of not ceding an inch of territory, 
and that includes Aksai Chin and the OK, etc. Then how do we really go about identifying the LSC? Do we have a plan related to build up national consensus and really back channel discussions to think of this kind of unless we do so, we are heading nowhere. This is for Jan Shankar Rai Chaudhary, sir. Can you elucidate? I can, I can hear you. I can hear you. Uh, well, I think we'll have to go by what we have done and in India, at least, you will have to go by the parliamentary uh, resolution, whether it is feasible or not, that India will not give up an inch of territory. Now, whether it is physically people or, or not, soldiers will have to work out, we will have to come to, uh, internally, we will have to come to a decision and an agreement as to what is achievable there has to be a military dimension to the problem and for that we have to build up our strength military strength along with that we also have to build up our economic strength now it is a gigantic task and we will have to start work because we've already lost a lot of time getting off the ground we'll have to develop economically, socially, and militarily. The watchword for China remains the same. Uh, com cooperate. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Cooperate, compensate, and confront. That remains the watchword with this will have to be our policy. We will have to follow this policy in the best national interest. It will not be a short term task. It will be a very long time term task. We have to keep going with it through successive governments. That is another issue we've got to keep in mind because the government, the political situation itself is confrontational within the country. So whatever may be decided by one government, the other government may or may not agree with it. These are the issues which are there in front of us. And we will have to come to the national aim, fulfill the national aim of restoring what we have lost in with a military backup and develop our economic strength. The soldiers in this battle, if I may use that term, it's, a, it's a become being used in all walks of life now. The soldiers in this battle are the soldiers, which is the military people, the traditional, but equal soldiers in the this task are our diplomats as well as our industrialists because they have to build up the economic backbone of the country to take on China. Can our industrialists, can our industrialists achieve high quality goods at low prices, which will outprice the Chinese goods out of the market, which China has done to us. Can we do it back to China militarily? We are developing, we have to develop further, but it is this economic arena, this economic theater, which we have to focus on. And there our soldiers are our industrialists and our economists and those who uh, will have to come and develop these products and conquer, if possible, the world market, get market share for it which is exactly what China has done. That is China's main strength. And let us see if we can do it. So I have Nilo, unmute your mic. Nilo, unmute your mic. Turn off. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for that answer. The next question is to General Mukherjee. So the question asked of you is that when you were commanding 15 Corps, it looked after the entire Ladakh sector. 
and the scenario that has been predicted by the participant who posts me this on the whatsapp is that should the situation there become one which is like the loc with indo uh, india and pakistan and that both the countries dig in where they are at the moment and become eyeball to eyeball in the near future for many many months and years to come how do we go from there and what do we do in such a scenario your personal experience in the co commander there can we then manage to see such a large number of troops armament and where with all that we have deployed continuously to be there and can the chinese also do the same and this becomes another loc like we do have between us and pakistan i think i'll first put across what i wanted to put across first as i think that will clarify a lot of issues i want to first emphasize totally reemphasize what general arun roy brought up the chinese have already except for a tiny bit at pangangso they have achieved what they wanted they have done exactly what they wanted to do and therefore ball is in our court not in their court it's only in pangang so that they slipped up a little they're already 18 kilometers in at depsa varying number of kilometers in all over the place even in pangang they well across our perception of the lsc in many areas they have crossed their perception of the lsc earlier the 1959 perception so i agree with arun that we are unlikely to go to war because they have already achieved their aims that is the first point second point i have seen from experience and long experience going back to when i was a youngster in the army whenever india has annoyed china they have activated the insurgency all over india but particularly in the northeast so as per my information currently they have already activated nsc and iam part of nsc and iam's hardening of stance is due to chinese pressurizing them similarly alpha their recruitment has also started increasing now this has been coupled with the government's decisions on ca and so on and so forth whatever has happened in the northeast national register of citizens and ca plus you've got a problem now of islamic fundamentalism coming up in the northeast all of this is going to be supported by china they've already started propping them up much more than what it was 2 months ago or 3 months ago so you expect to see the northeast getting reactivated the third issue here is as far as arunachal is concerned the chinese are gradually shifting focus towards arunachal so they have already built, started building up forces opposite arunachal also i will not go into the area because i think that remains classified but uh, yes there is a build up opposite arunachal so i don't see the chinese backing down or saying sorry uh, we're going back i don't see them doing that at all so it is a long haul there again i totally agree with arun now 14 and 15 core areas combined here again pakistan will do china's bidding and therefore whether we like it or not if it if does push does come to shove and we do go to war and then in that case we are going to have to deal with both of them 
you're going to have to go on to a holding front against the Pakistanis and deal with China more actively. It's a big area, a huge area, as far as holding it during winter is concerned. I'd say up to mid-December or so, you are still at a pinch able to carry out operations. It's post mid-December that the entire area, Kargil onwards, extending all the way to eastern Ladakh and northern Ladakh, that it becomes very heavily snowbound and it becomes very difficult. But that doesn't preclude air operations. So that is probably in a could carry on a snowbound situation till about uh, <coughs> April. About April. May onwards, things gradually start opening up, the ice thaws, and some movement can take place. But as I said, Chinese have already achieved what they wanted to, and we don't. Whether uh, we want to accept it or not, we slept. That's how they came in. They shouldn't have come in. And one of the reasons we doped was because of COVID-19. We got totally distracted, whether it be the government or whether it be anybody else. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question, which is there in the WhatsApp post, is for Mr. Guru Swami. Sir, in one of your writings, the participant has pointed out you have articulated that there is a case of giving it a consideration whether Moscow, that is Russia, which is equally friendly with China and India, can do something to meditate between India and China once the LSE is being discussed. Because both countries, the junior leadership, like you mentioned, would like to uh, make sure that the line of the LSE runs along features which are advantages to them and that maybe the politicians would not be really understanding of this but a military mind from Moscow if they meditate they would probably be in a position if both countries accept uh, to sincerely approach this it may be a long haul but it is an option would you elucidate sir I am of the opinion that the territorial issue cannot be solved for a long time to come. When, when, when Rajiv Gandhi first met Deng, he said, let it be left to history. Now, I don't think either India can give up Arunachal Pradesh or China can give up Aksai Chin. We both are totally invested in it and we can't. So that's why Deng in his wisdom, told Rajiv, let's leave it to history. And God knows what will happen in history. 100 years ago, China was not in Tibet or in Xinjiang. They were independent countries. China is there. 100 years later, 50 years later, things might change again. Now, the Soviet Union looked impregnable in the 1980s and suddenly imploded in 1990. So we don't know how a totalitarian state will end up. And it's, let's be very clear, China is a totalitarian state, centrally controlled by one party and now by one man and a small group of people. So how long will this control hold is something for history to decide. We will see something will happen. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, 50 years from now, this situation will not maintain in this, in this sector. Now, as far as the challenge, therefore, now to draw up an LSC. That is something which we both agree is the line we control. That you know that the control ends at that line. Now, if it has been, it was left so far to the military to decide with, with the Chinese military. And I don't think militaries are particularly get to give up territory. And in India, we too, and China, we too invested in territory, holding on to this feature holding on to that feature, and we keep looking at everything in square kilometers. So I don't think, I think we need something to, somebody who can 
take a strategic view and help us along in the discussion. The Russians I suggested as the mediator because you know we are already in a tripartite relationship, Russia, China, and Indian BRICS, then we are in SCO. Now, if India and China get into an antagonistic situation, that will be the end of the balance of power in the world. Because the balance of power will then shift back towards the West, something which we've been trying to avoid so far. The NATO, US will be totally dominant and the SEO was originally meant to be a bulwark against that. That will go. Are you ready to live in a world which is totally unipolar and dominated by the United States and NATO? It's something for, for us to consider. Therefore, I think getting an LSE is an immediate solution to our problem with China. And the Russians are equally familiar with our military and their mili Chinese military. They have friends on both sides. And this is something which we can use their good office to sort out. Now, suppose an Indian Corps commander agrees to give up five kilometers somewhere. Then we have to pay in this country, even within the army. His rivals, his competitors, all those life him on the back. It will be very difficult. Similarly, in situation with people in China. The PLA is also faction ridden. The PLA, after all, they're all human beings like us. Everyone is trying to make a career out there. And so, you know, I don't think the military alone can decide. The government of India has now sent uh, a joint secretary of the MEA to take part in the discussions. I don't think that is going to help either. Because I think the border has to, the LAC has to be drawn between military men. They know what is a strategically defensible line, what can be defended, what can't be defended. And I think the focus now is for both sides to get defensible lines, a defensible line. Some, sec some places we might be higher, some places they might be higher. So they have to take a calculated decision on that. Unfortunately, we need a third party here. Why are we shying away from, from, from arbitration on this? Of course, for all disputes to go for arbitration. And I think the Russians, are, the Americans can't come in. Trump has offered, but who is going to take Trump up on his offer? The Chinese or us? So who do we go to? And man, man, that conference took place in Moscow with Lavrov sitting there. Jay Shankar, Lavrov and Rani. However much the press might try to cover up that Lavrov was not there, the meeting took place under the aegis of Lavrov. But I think we should extend that a little more. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I think you, you said what had to be stated. And that is a fact that there are the glimpses of hope of at least somebody has to step in to arbitration. My last question on this event today is to Dr. Lalwani. Uh, Dr. Lalwani, one of the posts that I've received in the WhatsApp is that should India at this juncture really move in into the Western alliances, specifically with USA's showing its leadership, can we then trust USA? And what about our relations with USSR in that account? You know, there are three questions also in the chat. I know, sir, but time constraints at the moment, I don't think so. We will be able to take that on. Okay. So, and some of the questions I'm told are repetition of what has been already spoken of by the panelists. Dr. Lalwan. Sure. Why don't I try to be, I'll try to be brief. So maybe you can get to more questions. Um, the, the trust in the United States I get is a, is a, particularly salient one given uh, the tumult in uh, American politics uh, over the last three, four years. What I will say is that over the last two decades, um, the U.S.-India relationship has been surprisingly one of the most bipartisan foreign policy issues or ventures. Uh, and I expect that for the most part, that will remain consistent. What has occurred, I'd say, over the last two years are two things that might work against that bipartisan consensus. One is the way in which um, uh, the Indian government has engaged uh, Democrats and Republicans um, over the past uh, two years, or at least a perception of that. I think there's uh, still a great deal, a reservoir of support on both, both sides of the aisle, but uh, there has been sort of a noticeable 
um, partisan bent in, in India's engagements that might be more on the political end, but nevertheless it reflects on uh, Indian policy and it's been noticed by policymakers in, in Washington. And it would be unfortunate, as many analysts in DC have said, it would be unfortunate if this becomes a partisan issue, like for example, the Russia issue would become partisan. Because if that were the case, then India can't count on the US support in the same way that it has over the last 15 years, which have been tremendously beneficial to India's standing in the international community, access to multilateral institutions, uh, technology sharing, arms, intelligence, etc. So that would be a, a counterproductive move if we become, become more partisan. Uh, the other part is, you know, having to do with sort of what, what is perceived to be India's slightly illiberal turn. I don't think that is as decisive. What it will do, though, it reduces the discount that India has received from the United States and other Western powers over the last decade and a half. It does not undermine the strategic logic of that relationship, but it does change the price point of it. And the expectations of the United States on the strategic end will be greater if it can no longer assume that India is going to be an equal champion of liberal democracy uh, in, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. On the Russia question, this is a, a real challenge, I think, for both sides. I think India has real arguments as to why it can't simply renegotiate its equation with Russian, uh, particularly Russian arms, but also its sort of diplomatic relationship. And the U.S. and there are real arguments as to why it prohibits certain types of acquisition interoperability. So I think both sides probably need to start thinking about second best equations in the relationship. India will not get fifth generation fighters from the United States. It cannot hope to do so if it acquires the S-400. But that doesn't have to be an obstacle to the relationship if we can find workarounds, like different types of arms transfers uh, and the finding utility in the S-400, which can be a formidable defense against um, on the LAC against China. So I, I think it's simply about moving through the, the, the the, the discussion forward beyond sort of these interoperability and acquisitions problems to ones where we accept uh, both the, each other's constraints and then find sort of second best solutions from that point onwards. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lalwani. I noticed on the chat box that Madam Sun uh, wanted to ask a question in so far as whether China has achieved its goals. Madam Sun, would you like to uh, put your question to any of the panelists? Or would you like me to take a call on one of the panelists to answer your question? Um, thank you, sir. Um, the question is that we we have heard several panelists mentioning that China has already achieved its goals. And I wonder what is the implication of that? And what does India expect to come out of that? Does that mean that China will stop from now on? And India should not expect more Chinese assertive behaviors along the, for example, in the Western sector? or uh, this is uh, only temporary that China has achieved its goals, but China has more, more goals to achieve. Because the answer to this question very much determines where India should, should prepare itself for the, for the future. So thank you. I welcome any comments from any of the panelists. Thank you. Uh, General Roy, sir, would you like to take this question on? Well, I, have already, I have already spoken about it, uh, MS Yonsen. You see, to my point of view, as I said, China is the satisfied power between the two at the moment, sitting where it is sitting. Uh, whereas we Indians feel slighted about it. There will be no doubt that in today's world and for a change, which for a good change, actually, I see that uh, diplomacy is not trying to supplant the military capability in a total manner for a change. It's a cancerous paradigm which has been happening. So when you give the military some kind of leeway by the diplomats, then the situation on the ground can change. It can change at any time. As Mr. Guru Swami said that if five kilometers are given away to China, that core commander will be in thick soup. But it can be the other way around, too. If he manages that five kilometers, if he manages to start patrolling back again to the areas. However, the end result is, uh, MS Sun is, we have to have a sit down, a properly demarcated boundary, a proper issue to come to a wholesome solution. Otherwise, till then, it is not possible. And in this particular issue, I hold China totally responsible because they've never given us a map. Am I right, uh, Professor Kupati? 
They've never given us a map to their view of to the where perception of a line, whereas we have. We want to bring it back to where it has to be. We have to demarcate, you know, delineate. Yes, we have done all. We have to demarcate that particular place to come to a permanent solution. And that permanent solution, China may occupy whatever it can. It is not that they can't be thrown out. They can be thrown out in a particular uh, place or this thing at maybe great cost, but it can be done, maybe with American help. You see, if there is a conflict tomorrow, and if it is a prolonged conflict, I can assure you, nobody is going to be the winner. And if there is a tie between the two, India will be sitting pretty that it is a tie, but in China, it is not going to be accepted. The Chinese will not accept a tie because they have now thought to, to be a superpower in this Asian context. Have I answered your question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My only concluding one sentence remark is like I read an article the other day in the Times of India, where one of the columnists stated that the British have been very bad cartographers in so far as the subcontinent is concerned, so say the Chinese. And therefore, we face this problem over the last seven decades. Nevertheless, we have had a very exciting evening and very good de detailed deliberations morning as it is in the United States. And on behalf of our mentor, General Sankar Roy Chaudhary and our president, General Mukherjee, I thank you all for having participated in this very, very detailed deliberations that we have had today. And I thank all our viewers who have, I notice, not only been ringing up on my WhatsApp and posting it, but have been on the chat box. And we see a large number of people having shared your views on today's deliberation. Thank you once again. Thank you, panelists. With that, I come to the end of today's deliberations. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, all of you. Bye. And very good meeting you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Nilu. Thank you, sir.